I'll start uh, from my right. Uh, Ming is founder of CSC Upshot. It's uh, several, she briefed me, it's a several hundred million uh, dollar fund here in the US, but also raised a lot of money from China, from Asia. Uh, Eric Kim is a co-founder and managing partner at Goodwater Capital and uh, several hundred million dollars here, also under management. And Eric Osiakwan, its managing partner at Shanso Capital, raised tens of millions of dollars. I think the context also, like one thing it's raising hundreds of millions in the Bay Area or China, another is raising tens of millions in Africa. So I definitely have a group of true experts from both fundraising perspective and then now, now you're building your portfolio company now. So, just giving the context of the global investing, uh, one thing that we were chatting before that I thought it was really interesting is, Ming, you have raised money from Asia, and most of your investments are here. Uh, Eric uh, from Shanso, I think I'll just put Eric O, oh, that's in the faster, Eric O, oh, Eric O, oh. <laughs> uh, you raised money in the US, to invest in Africa. So LP from the west going to the south or north to the south. And then Eric K, uh, you raise money globally to invest globally. So your LPs and founders are everywhere. So all of a sudden we see this movement of capital going through them and then going to other places, which make this like a really good combination of panels. So uh, without sort of further ado, can you give me one line of what your investment thesis is? Main. Should I go? All right, so uh, first of all, I, I think that I, wa I want to thank you for that introduction because the, the thought of being global is, is very, very important today. And um, the fact that we, CSE Upshot, actually, our capital are mostly from China, so we have my biggest LPs is a CSE, is a private equity firm in China. I also have Baidu as one of my LPs in China. And the focus really is to deploy capital here in the US, but not just in the US, but also it's very key to point out that we're focusing on very early stage companies. We have a very close partnership with AngelList, which I think you all heard about earlier. So our biggest investment thesis and our primary investment thesis really is to invest and support early stage companies here in the US in close partnership with AngelList so that we can then facilitate and then uh, push forward the growth of the early stage ecosystem here. Thank you. Is this on? Hello? On now? Okay. Um, so Eric Kim with Goodwater Capital. Uh, we are a quote unquote emerging manager, I guess. Um, we're about two years old now as a firm. Um, our goal and ambition for Goodwater is that someday Goodwater Capital will, will, will be synonymous with expertise and passion for consumer technology. Uh, my partner and I both spun out of very large firms, multi-billion dollar platforms. We had 20 years of venture experience between the two of us. Uh, we wanted to create a firm dedicated to consumer investing, consumer internet investing specifically. The vast majority of what we do is here in Silicon Valley. I'd say 60, 75% of what we do is, is here. What we then do is take those insights and also think where else in the world would these theses be best expressed? So we may have a thesis on P2P payments, for example, and we'll invest in companies like Venmo and, and, and whatnot here in the US, but it turns out that there may be companies that are growing much faster outside of the US as well. We've also found that thesis origination not only comes from Silicon Valley now, you actually have to pay attention to what's going on in China, in Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, other parts of the world, because innovation is sometimes happening faster in some of these more consumer-centric markets. So now we're doing this truly cross-border pollination of, of thesis generation as well. And as a result, our investments, again, for the most part, are located here in the Valley, but we are finding opportunistically some great investments overseas as well in the key categories and theses that we know very, very well. So if you, th um, so if you think of the 20th century, um, you think of Asia, uh, then you zero into China and think of a company called Alibaba, right? So flip to the 21st century, think about Africa, 
and then potentially think about mobile money. How many of you know mobile money or have heard of mobile money? All right, so um, in the global now, your money is on the card. In Africa, the money is in the phone. So imagine your money now on your phone. So that's mobile money. It's an innovation that came from Kenya and is pretty much going to, it's ha having a lot of effect on the fintech market globally. And then connect that with Bitcoin and then it becomes very interesting. So our thesis is that Africa is going to produce the most, the greatest technology company of the 21st century. And we want to found and invest in that company. So I'll give you some example. Um, Goldman Sachs just went into a company called Africa Internet Group at a billion dollar valuation for $300 million. Um, and this company is growing really fast. Another example is a company called Iroko TV um, that returned 30X to its early investors after three years. I can go on and on, but our big thesis is that the 21st century is Africa's uh, century and Africa is going to produce some of the greatest technology companies. Sorry, it's not going to be in Silicon Valley. Great. So thinking about the cross-border and where your investment thesis is, uh, the foundation it's laid on, what would you say would be like one trend that you'd say, oh, this is the trend that we're riding on? One big investment sector trend. It, yes, it can be hot or not sector, I would say super hot sector that you were really excited. It can be around emerging of the middle class. It can be the mobile uh, phone, anything that you think like this would be like, if you think about cross-border associated with your thesis, what is like one area that is most important that is very tied to your thesis? Well, I, I think for us, because we invest uh, at such an early stage and a lot of our companies could easily pivot from sector to sector, right? Um, you could say that you don't do gaming, but then do you do messaging? Do you do not do messaging? Do you do gaming? So for us, I think one big thesis that kind of ties in all the companies together that we think really affect this globalness is uh, big data driven. And I know the previous panel on, on the Moneyball talk about the data. And um, for us, even as a fund ourselves, we use the data on Angelus, we use the data on Metamark to then help us invest at scale. And also, as we look at underlying companies, we also believe in this whole big data connection play. So in our own portfolio companies, we were lucky enough to uh, invest into cruise automations. So that's an automated um, company that got acquired by GM, so that's leveraged a lot of the software integration on the data side, and we also invest in a couple uh, consumer demand marketplaces that again leverages on data. So I think that um, the, the thesis that ties in uh, on the data-driven side and, and the focus on that. That's great. I would say for the past five years, the iTunes Store and Google Play Store have proven that borders in consumer net are essentially meaningless, country borders that is. Um, Two of the biggest deals that have returned the most amount of money to LPs uh, include WhatsApp, which um, Jim Getz and Sequoia invested in. And that was not, I mean, they were based here in Palo Alto, but the majority of users were not here in the US. The majority of the users were outside of the US. The other one that we were lucky to be involved with, which is a Korean company called Kakao, which went public at 9.5 billion, also a messaging company. So I think those two companies and others like that for the past five years prove that there are no meaningful borders with regards to mobile apps um, related digital companies. I think the next five, next 10 years, what we're looking at and what we're seeing is that there are no meaningful borders anymore with, regar with regards to com commerce. So just like digital information was able to go border to border, or country to country, we think commerce now, because there are three things driving that. One, obviously the app store. Secondly, is logistics. Global logistics is really kicking in now. And third, payments, global payments. The, Things like, people don't even notice really the things like Stripe and Alipay integrations. What's that doing, what that is doing for the ecosystem these days. So these really, these three things we think are gonna drive uh, global commerce now for the next five to 10 years. Um, so one of the things um, about being a late comer is that sometimes you can leapfrog. So if you take Africa, um, Africa leapfrogged the world from a lack of fixed line infrastructure straight to mobile. So um, Africa is not only a mobile only, uh, a mobile first, but it's a mobile only continent. So most people in Africa are seeing the internet for the first time on their mobile phone. And so most of the developers are developing straight into mobile. 
And so that leap is really interesting. And we begin to see interesting innovation, like I said, mobile money, which is totally disrupting the fintech world. So I think my money, for example, is in the fintech space. Uh, I just backed another company in the um, logistics space. It's a company called Forhey, F-O-R-H-E-Y.com. And it's an Uber for laundry. So imagine how you, you order Uber, now you can order your laundry as well. Um, I just backed another company called Visa app. Um, so now you can order your doctor um, using this app. Right. So these are interesting, simple logistics challenges that you find in Africa. And these startups are using software infrastructure to address that. Um, so those are sort of the trends that, some of the trends we're seeing. Great. Uh, my last question, is, it's going to be a little bit in the order, but then we'll open a little more discussion, is let's focus, when you think about cross-border, like the way I deconstruct that is that it means that you build network and bridge. That's how like you can move from one area. So assuming that that is one definition of doing the cross-border, can you help us sort of walk through on how you build those, like, because if you spend primitive your time, let's say in the Bay Area, like how do you look at things in Asia uh, or vice versa, right? Like how, how, do you, how do you lay the infrastructure of that cross, whatever that means of the cross border? Okay, I will start that. So for example, we, we look at Africa, and yes, I, I guess you're looking at me saying, well, Africa is 54 countries in a continent, right? Not, it's not a country. Um, and, and so how do we do that? And as a fund, we have a thesis we call the Kings of Africa. So take the BRICS or the G20 acronym, for example. We have five countries that are leading the digital economy in Africa. Um, let's see how well you know Africa. So Kings is K-I-N-G-S. So K stands for which country? Oh, wow, people know Africa here. This is impressive. I stands for Ivory Coast. It's a French-speaking country here. I will forgive you. The rest is N is... G is, S is, great. So we think that those five countries actually lead the digital economy in Africa. So, so we want to invest in companies from these markets or that we can take into these markets. And our primary um, consideration is that it must be a startup that's looking at Africa wide, right? And then as best case, going global. So some of the startups that we look at, well, we, we may look at a country specific startup for a place like Nigeria. Because Nigeria is 200 million people. Like, that's like four countries or five countries in one. Right? So Nigeria is sort of an, an exception to the rule. I was chatting with Eric a little bit about a company that he got introduced to. And I thought, yeah, it's, it's worth looking at in that sense. But that's a company that you can pretty much scale into every other market because it's e-commerce. It's consumer-facing. Uh, and like you said, there are no barriers, right? So you can just push it to any market that you want um, out of Nigeria. And so, and so for us, we, we see companies that are coming from these markets as sort of the leading spaces, but we also see innovation in other markets. And the other thing to look at Africa is that it's not just um, Anglophone and Francophone countries, but they're also Lusophone countries. So I just spent some time in um, Mozambique. And, and it's interesting to find startups in Mozambique. And then I went to visit my friend in Lisbon and then met an investor there who is actually invested in a company in Mozambique. And then he's introducing me on email to an angel network that is starting up in Mozambique. And I said, hey, I'm happy to come help out. And so I'm going to go there in, in August and go see um, some of the investors and some of the startups there. But it was kind of eye-opening to go into these other you know, countries and, and see this level of innovation and also an investing community uh, imagine bottom up. And so, you know, to end it, we, we try to do this also by doing an event we call Angel Fair Africa. And the website is angelfairafrica.com, where every year we go into a new country, right? And we stage an event where we bring the investors from around different parts of the continent into the country. And we also invite investors. We invite those from the country, those from outside the country, and also from the valley. This year we're doing it in Kenya from the 10th to the 11th of November. So with uh, Betty's permission, I'd like to invite you if you want to come. Um, give me a chat um, afterwards, and we'll be happy for you to see what's happening down there. Uh, so building sort of investor community, it's one way to hack the network. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to do the tactical things, create networks locally. You can use data. They, the previous panel was on data, and that's very powerful. I mean, at the end of the day, though, I think 
to, to be willing to go and get on a plane <laughs> and actually go visit the entrepreneurs and take your expertise from Silicon Valley or wherever and bring that to another country. You, you just you have to have a passion for it. I think it, it's so easy to fall into the day-to-day -day rhythms of investing in your backyard. But I'll tell you that if you want to chase and you want to find the best returns, we have to break that mentality. We have to break out of that mentality of just investing in our backyard. You will have missed some of the best deals in the past two years, period. Now, some of them are still being built here for sure, um, but I think that's what drives us, is this passion that at the end of the day, on behalf of our LPs, we want to invest in the best portfolio, period. And that involves us taking a lot of energy, doing the tactical things, throwing the parties. We like to throw lots of parties yeah, all over yeah, the world. Yep, yeah. um, you know, doing all those things to, to make it work. But there's network effects to that. If you build that global network, there's network, network effects to that. Yeah, I, mean, I think for us, really, it comes, just comes back to the fact that we're trying to build a full circle. We're raising capital. We got capital from China. We're investing here in the U.S. But ultimately, we want to deliver return to our LPs. I'm not just saying that for the LPs in the room. I mean, that, that's ultimately what we are all here to do. That is our job, is to deliver return to our LPs. And how do we do that? How we do that is really by bringing extra value and differentiated value that we can add to our portfolio companies, very much to my two Eric's here, to my, <laughs> uh, to my right. And, uh, and so I think that brings the whole full circle where we have capital flow coming into the US, but then we then create value here, and then that value then, we then assist in partnerships or developments of our companies, and then go over there to Asia, and that develop this full circle, pivot back in on, um, a lot of the visits, a lot of trips, and then going back to the platform and data and, and leverage all the resources that we have. I'm going to ask some yes, no questions and raise your hand for yes. Uh, you're building a cross-border investment thesis. Uh, it's so much easier to raise money from LP for being cross-border. Raise your hand. It's easier. OK, great. Uh, can you qualify? I think maybe that a, a brief discussion here. Can you tell us like when you have a cross border, how did you f give us some hacks about your fundraising pitch with your LPs? Help us raise more money. <laughs> so so uh, the reason I raised my hand was that if you're like everyone else, you're going to be undifferentiated. If you're differentiated, you have a different view of the world and you can back that up with numbers and track record and a reasonable thesis about how you're going to repeat that on a going forward basis, you're going to be differentiated and more LPs will want to invest in you on a going forward basis. So that, I mean, that's kind of the, the rationale behind why I raised my hand is that is actually, if you can incorporate this global view, because that is the new reality we're living in. That it's, it, we, are, we, are, we are past that point of, we are a globalized economy now. We are past that and embracing it and making that your strategic advantage actually makes your capital raise um, better and easier, or uh, I think a, a higher quality capital raise, I would say. Um, and then, yeah, just, uh, but not being afraid of that. I think, I think you have to not be afraid of that, uh, how people will react. You have to really embrace it. That's great. Uh, another yes, no question. The final one they gave me already, no more time. Uh, you're investing cross-border. Founders should go global from day one. <laughs> Eric is the one in the middle. I mean, I'll let you do the final um, comment or qualifying what I said. Well, I, I think that to Eric Kim's point that we are in a globalized economy, so the founders need to have a global mindset. How could you start a company that is not global? <laughs> Correct? <laughs> so I think that, that is why, because that's just the, the, the world we live in. Um, founders need to start with a global mindedness, even though you may execute locally. And I know a lot of people said those phrases, you know, execute locally, focus globally. But that's truly today's economy, today's world. You have to think that way. You have to embody it. And, and that's how you have to, to, to create your company. Thank you very much. I know this is the, the final note is thank you very much. You know that there's no agreement here and unfortunately we didn't have enough time for further discussion, but I want to thank you for making the opportunity available to any talent that's around the world. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you.